Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody in. This is number four. And uh, for those of you here in the studio, why, after this, we're ready to go home. For those of you out in television, why, you'll just have to wait another week. But uh, anyway, we're glad to have you with us. We're just an informal Bible study, and uh, I have to go through this every time because every day we get tons of new letters of new listeners, so we know our audience is growing. So for those of you that are just catching us, for, in fact, one young lady wrote a while back, and she said, I saw you for a minute or two, and I thought, how boring. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, I moved on. She said, several days later, I happened to catch you again. I thought, well, maybe I should listen. She said, in five minutes, I was hooked. She said, now I watch you every day. So I suppose that's pretty typical. I imagine a lot of people see this and they think, how boring. No music, no entertainment. <laughs> but anyway, the Lord has seen fit to do otherwise, and uh, we do. We appreciate all your letters and your prayers and your financial help because, after all, it does take money to pay the bills. But I'm going to take a minute to do something that we routinely don't do on the program. and. Uh, all of our past programs, of course, beginning with Genesis on up through the Old Testament and up through the New, have been available, of course, on video and audio tapes, and they've all been transcribed into print. But now we've got something that I have been really excited about, and that is a listener in Indiana has put together a book of 88 questions that are routinely asked of the ministry. And he has formulated all the answers from our past material. I know that Paul has spent hours putting all this together, and uh, we are just thrilled to death to be able to offer it to our listening audience for just our cost, $11. And if you're interested, you give us a call, and we'll get them out to you. Back into Hebrews, Honey says, Book 52. <laughs> For those of you out on television, if you're inquiring about this set of programs today, it'll be a part of Book 52. And uh, always remember that number one was back in Genesis, so we have covered a lot of territory over the last several years. All right, so now we're back into Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, let's see, Jerry's got verse 2 up there on the board. And so we continue on with this whole concept now then that Christ is not only our Savior, our Lord, He is the author, He is the file leader of everything that we believe, and for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame, and as a result of having finished that glorious work of the cross, he what? Sat down. You remember several months ago, and I think I even rehearsed it again in the last program, and I'm not going to apologize. I share it every place I go. Twice in all of human history, God did something so perfect, so flawless, that even He Himself could add nothing to it. And what did He do? He sat down. The first one was after creation. The last verse of Genesis 1 says, And he looked, and it was very good, which in the Hebrew just means it was perfect. He couldn't do another thing to make it any better. And then we don't have that repeated until the book of Hebrews when it says, And after he had purged us from our sin, or he had finished the work of the cross again, it was something so perfect, so flawless, something to which nothing could be corrected or improved upon. And again, there was nothing left to do but what? Sit down. It was done. And so all through Scripture then, we have this constant repetition that after he had finished the work of the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the Father, having finished the work of the cross. And here's another one, see? In fact, the first one, let's just flip back a few pages to Hebrews chapter 3. 
or Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, rather. <coughs> Because this is, this is what we have to realize. That when he finished it, plus nothing, it was so perfect that he could sit down. And what have I added all the way along? And people have come along of one stripe or another, but oh, you got to do this, but you've got to do that. You have to do this. No. If that's the case, then he didn't finish it. If you have to do something else besides believe it, then it was not perfect. There was something left to be done, but it was. It was finished. It was done. And we dare not try and add to it. All right, Hebrews 1 verse 3 says it even plainer than Hebrews 12. Who, speaking of God the Son, being the brightness of His glory, and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sin, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Why? Because it was perfect. There wasn't anything more to be done. And so, all through the book of Hebrews, we have this emphatic statement that he was the Son. He finished the work of redemption. And when he finished it, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. All right, now then, let's move on into verse 3. Hebrews chapter 12, now verse 3. <coughs> Consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. In other words, go back and experience some of the things he went through leading up to the crucifixion. And Paul says to these people, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. What's it speaking of? I think it's speaking of those sweat drops of blood that came on his brow as he was approaching the work of the cross. Verse 5, you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, of course, Paul, as I've said so often, can shift gears. Now, all of a sudden, he's coming back to the response of the people to whom he's writing. And he said, you haven't gone through anything like this, but you have forgotten a lot of things, one of which was that God is going to chasten the one that he loves. Now, a lot of people don't like to accept that. But you see, whenever God puts the believer through a hard situation. It isn't because he doesn't love him. It isn't because he has left off taking care of him. It's for what purpose? To increase their faith. It's to increase our trust that come what may. Yes, it may entail suffering. It may entail some sickness. It may entail the loss of a loved one. But through it all, what's the promise? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never leave off being all that he has claimed to be. All right, so he says, Don't despise the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked. Now here's the reason, verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. He's going to discipline us from time to time. And he's going to scourge every son whom he receiveth. Now it isn't because of a meanness, it isn't because he likes to see us grovel and suffer, but he is disciplining us in order to walk a stronger walk of faith. And again, you take all the witnesses of chapter 11. They didn't have a rose petal pathway, and I've used that expression over and over on the program. When we become a believer, it is not that all of a sudden everything is going to go our way. Most of the time, it's the opposite. It's tougher to be a believer than it is to be out there in the world. 
because we've got all the opposition of satanic forces against us. Satan has hated everything that pertained to God ever since Adam and Eve were in the garden. And that hasn't changed. And so we have to be aware that things are going to come up in our lives that we think are rather uncomfortable. Some of it God permits as a chastening process to increase our faith, to increase our Christian discipline. All right? Verse 7, if you endure chasing, in other words, it's just like, and he's going to use the example of, of uh, physical parents. Why do, we, why do we discipline our kids? Well, because we love them. Not because we love to disappoint them. We discipline them because we love them, all right? And he's bringing it right into the Christian experience. So if you endure the chastening, the hard times, God dealeth with you as with sons or with born ones, family members. For what sin is he whom the father chasteneth not? If a father never disciplines, he's not a father. This kid becomes a wastrel. All right? Verse 8, if you be without chastisement, in other words, if nothing ever happens to make you run to the Lord for help, then we have every right to doubt that maybe we're not a child of God because we're going to have problems. Satan's not going to leave us alone if we're a true child of God. All right, so here's the whole idea that if you're without chastisement, of which you are all partakers, then you're illegitimate. You're not truly a child of God, and you're not a son. Verse 9, furthermore, we have had fathers of the flesh. See, here he brings it into the earthly experience. We have fathers of the flesh who corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Why, I bet I can make every person in this room smile. When did your parents lay the switch to you. Sure, every one of you can remember. I can remember one in particular, and I imagine I can strike a chord with all of you. After Dad had given me a good whipping, I'll never forget, he set me on a concrete well base where the water pump stood. And he says, give Dad a hug. <laughs> I wouldn't do it. <laughs> I wouldn't do it, and so I got another one, see? <laughs> Well, the whole idea was he wanted me to know that what had happened was because he loved me. And you've all been there, every one of you. And so parents do these things because they love their kids, and a child should respond knowing that this is why they got it, for their own good. All right, Paul is saying the same thing as spiritually, see? So he says, we've had fathers in the flesh who corrected us or spanked us, whipped us, switched us, whatever the case may be. I always say switch because my mom's favorite weapon was a willow stick. Have you ever been hit with a willow stick around the calf of your leg? Yeah. Stings like fire. Doesn't hurt you all that much, but it sure stings. All right. That's what God does to us. He chastens us. See? All right. Now then, if our earthly fathers got that kind of response... How much rather shouldn't we be in subjection to the Father of the spirit world and live? Now verse 10, he comes back again to the earthly uh, scenario. For they, our parents, our mom and dad, verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. That was their responsibility. But what was their reason? For our profit for our own good, that we might be partakers of His holiness. Now verse 11, oh, this is so true. Chastening for the present is not joyous, of course not. When we were kids and we got that whipping, we bawled our eyes out, right? It was awful. But the end result, hopefully, was for our good. All right, now Paul is bringing it right back into the spiritual. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them who are exercised thereby. Verse 12, what's the first word? Wherefore? 
In other words, learn the lesson that as a child is disciplined for his own good, God does the same thing with us to increase our faith. Now, I've always made a warning as long as I've been teaching this, and that's a long time already. Always be careful that when a believer is going through hard times that you don't, in your own mind or even speak it to others, well, they must be guilty of some sin and God is spanking them. No, not necessarily. Because there are two reasons God brings adversity into the life of the believer. Two, not one. The one is yes. He needs disciplining and he needs to be brought back into fellowship and God will discipline for that. The second one is, as Abraham was told to give up Isaac, it wasn't because Abraham needed discipline. What was the purpose? His faith to exercise his faith. And so always remember that. If a believer is going through hard times, health, finance, or whatever, God may be just doing all this to increase their faith, to just strengthen them spiritually. And I always tell people the individual himself knows what it is. The individual believer knows that if God is spanking him because he's been a disobedient child, he knows it. It's not for you and I to determine. And so we just look at it that God in His own purposes deals with the believer as He sees fit. All right, so verse 12 is, Wherefore, because of what we should learn from this experience, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. In other words, bring all these things into the right perspective. Now verse 14, an admonition in our everyday experience, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. I'm going to come down quickly to the next verse, because here's to me the meat of this chapter. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. Now, you've got to reflect back. Here we go all the way back to Genesis again. What was Esau's problem, if you remember my teaching back in Genesis? That's right, Pat. He was destitute of faith. Esau never saw any good in anything that God said. He may have been a nice guy. You know, I've said that over and over. Esau was probably a nicer young man than Jacob, but he had no faith. What God said meant nothing to Esau. Now, if you have a man destitute of faith, what is he not always, but what is he most apt to be morally? The pits. Because, see, faith is what maintains biblical morality. And without it, there's no constraint. That's what's the matter with the world today. They no longer believe this book. It's no longer relevant. And so, consequently, their morality is, is accordingly. All right, that was Esau. Esau had no biblical morality. And the reason he didn't have any morality, he had no faith. All right, and so this is the example. Lest there be someone among you that is an amoral, immoral individual like Esau, who for one morsel of food, bowl of beans, you remember, sold his birthright? Well, why did he give up the tremendous future opportunity of the birthright for a bowl of beans? Because he had no faith. That birthright didn't mean a thing to Esau because it was a spiritual thing. And spiritual things mean nothing to people who have no faith. And so Esau is the perfect example through Scripture of a man destitute of faith, consequently becomes immoral, and he counts for nothing 
anything spiritual. And so that was Esau. Gave up the birthright for a bowl of red beans because he saw no value in it. Jacob, what little faith he had, knew that there was something to be gained spiritually, not materially, spiritually. And Esau said, who cares? All right, but now read on to the next verse, verse 17. For, he says, you know how that afterward, after he had given up the birthright for a bowl of beans, then sometime later, you remember, when he could have or would have inherited the blessing, which was the material part of the estate, and when he could have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Now, of course, you've got to go all the way back and pick up the story. It was literally preordained by a sovereign God that this should fall into place. But you remember how Jacob sort of befuddled Isaac and got there before Esau and got the blessing. Now, here comes Esau. The spiritual aspect meant nothing to him, but the material... Hey, that meant everything. Now look what he did. When he was rejected, he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully or emotionally. I mean, the man was just in a total upheaval with what? Tears. He bawled his eyes out as a man. Why? Because he lost the material part of the mistake that was going to be his. Now, you have to read this verse carefully when it says that he was rejected for he found no place of repentance. It wasn't that Esau was looking for repentance for himself. Who was he expecting to repent or change his mind? His father. See, he was trying to get Isaac to change his mind, and Isaac wouldn't. And so this is what the Scripture is showing us. Esau isn't trying to repent himself. Esau is only trying to convince Isaac to change his mind and take it back away from Jacob and give it to Esau. But it was all for nothing. And so even though he sought it carefully with tears, well, what's the lesson? Oh, the lesson is don't be caught in unbelief. Unbelief is devastating. Unbelief causes people to lose the peace with God, the tranquility, the joy of this life, but far more important, eternity. In fact, a verse just comes to mind. Come all the way back with me to Romans. Romans, chapter 5, verse 1. And see, this is what we have to learn from, from examples like Esau. Oh, he was destitute of faith. Spiritual things didn't mean a thing to him. He was a tremendous deer hunter. Take him, didn't take him long to go out and come home with the venison. But spiritually, he had nothing. And he couldn't care for anything spiritual. But for us who believe, look at the difference. Romans 5, verse 1. My, what a promise. Therefore, being justified by what? Faith, the same thing we've been talking about for weeks on end now here in Hebrews 11. Being justified by faith, plus nothing, there's nothing added here. Justified by faith, we have the here and now, what? Peace with God. What more could we ask for? to be at peace with the sovereign, eternal ruler of the universe who no longer has one ounce of controversy against us? Not a bit. Why? Because we've believed. We've placed our faith in that finished work. All right? So justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom? Through Him and Him alone. We have access, how? By faith. Into this grace wherein we stand. All right, then I have to always go from here right over to 8, 
Romans 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1. Oh, one of my favorite verses. Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, see, because of what he's just been saying, including this verse in chapter 5, therefore, there is now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a fabulous position to be in? God cannot make one accusation against us because it's under the blood. Our faith has caused him to cancel it. Now, that's not license. Goodness sakes, I've said that a hundred times, if more, more. That's not license. That doesn't tell us to go and do as we please. Quite the opposite. But... Nevertheless, this whole concept of faith that causes God to give us peace with himself and takes away all condemnation, and that makes us totally opposite, coming back to Hebrews, to people like Esau. Now remember, Esau isn't the only man like this. This is the world in general. The world in general is more like Esau than they are anything else. They have no faith. They have no concern about what God says. As long as they got money in the bank and got a roof over their head and food to eat, that's all they care about. But for us who know better, our faith becomes everything. Okay, now verse 18. Oh my goodness, we only got a minute left. <laughs> well, we'll take one more verse. For he says, for you, speaking to these Hebrews now, who are, don't ever forget the concept, Paul is still trying to convince them that this whole concept of salvation through grace by faith alone is so much better than the law and Judaism and all the things that came from the Old Testament believers. But he says, you're not come to the mount that might be touched and burned with fire. Where is he taking them? Back to Mount Sinai. Back to Mount Sinai. And what happened at Mount Sinai? The law was given. And he says, you're not under that. Okay. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.